Hey guys, Ron Earnhardt here from creativesoundlab.tv. Well, today we're talking about getting great drum sounds from common mics. I wanna break it down for you on exactly how this drum set and this sound is created and recorded. There's a few different layers going on here to ensure a great sound. And I'm gonna be using nothing fancy today, just common microphones to get this drum sound. Okay, these are, you know, fairly standard mics. Um, you know, SM7B is probably the most expensive mic of this entire kit. Yeah, SM7B is something that a typical studio might have. A lot of times it's a great vocal mic if you can afford a $2,000 mic. So I chose that for the kick. Then I also have an Audix i5 on the snare top, the SM57 on the snare bottom. SM57 on the rack tom, and the Audix D4 on the floor tom. For overheads, I did a few different shootouts of different mics. I checked out a Vanguard V1, um, even a Soyuz 13, but I really want to feature the, uh, the Lewitt um, LCT-140 Air. Uh, these are, uh, you know, these are actually really inexpensive mics, and they sound fantastic. Yeah, I mean, they don't have the thickness that a transformer inside the mic might impart, but these actually are fantastic mics if you just need a balanced, smooth sound out of your cymbals. So again, nothing about this is extravagant. I'm trying to use kind of standard mics that, you know, aren't expensive here and are super accessible. Let's hear each of these mics in the kit and then soloed. Okay, so let's talk about some basic microphone positions here. Uh, for kick, my standard approach is to go about a third of the way in the drum. So if you have a drum set that has the porthole on the bottom uh, right, which is about four o'clock, it may be hard to manipulate a small boom arm into the drum. And so what actually might be helpful is instead of buying a different boom arm, you can actually loosen up the front head and rotate the head so that the sound hole is at a more convenient spot to get a boom arm inside the drum. Yeah, I mean, the label, the brand name of the drum set will be crooked, but that sound hole or that vent will be um, at a much better position for a boom arm. And then you can get the mic much further in and not worry about it rubbing up against the boom stand and making noise. So here I have the SM7B about a third of the way in. So here's a couple different depths of that same mic just to show you the difference. One really cool trick is to use the kick pad by Earthworks. It actually is a, I think a 12 dB pad, but it has a built-in EQ. So it actually transforms um, really, really nicely, uh, like an SM57 into a kick mic, or an SM7B in this case, into a more suitable kick sound. So here it is without that kick pad, and then with the kick pad. A lot of times, if you just choose the right head, you'll do okay with kick drum. For me, it's a Power Stroke 3 with a couple different blankets or towels inside. Then you get uh, you know, a microphone that does okay with capturing low end and high SPL, and then you'll be fine. 
Usually what happens is, is that for low-end sources, you're going to be relying more on colored mics. And then more for high-end sources, high-frequency sources, you're going to be more uh, relying on balancing out that tone, but keeping it fairly neutral in the color. For example, um, you probably wouldn't record a glockenspiel with a bright mic. You would probably record it with a dark mic because it's a very bright instrument. And that dark mic is probably very evenly sloped, something like a ribbon. We see this with overhead mics. A lot of dark mics work very well for overheads. You could also say, oh, you know, violin and so forth. Um, but we go to say floor tom and you know, a, a little difference of changing out the mic, um, you know, can be huge in the sound. You know, like, yeah, it's the same drum, but that mic choice can make a big difference. So kick and floor tom, we really see that the mic choice is important here. Yeah, I mean, this is SM7B. I chose it just to kind of as this theme for the video of mics that you know, are pretty common in a typical studio. But, you know, definitely changing out the mic here is going to make a big difference. And it's not necessarily something that um, you can get with EQ, it, you know, it just kind of gets you a vibe very quickly so you can build on top of that. I want to mention that this is my homebrew subkick. You know, uh, subkicks are just a speaker and it's a transducer, right? So a transducer, you have movement and you have magnetism and then you have some sort of current. Sometimes the flow goes one way, sometimes it goes the other way. So in a guitar pickup, it goes from a mechanical vibration into electricity. And with the case of like a speaker system, we have electricity going into mechanical, creating acoustic vibration. So it's really not going backwards for a speaker, but we are moving the speaker as a membrane. It's passing by magnets and it's creating a voltage. So it's really quite easy to create a microphone which a dynamic microphone that is, out of any speakers that you have. And especially if it's open back, then we have basically a cardioid microphone. I wouldn't do this for a closed back guitar cabinet because closed back would basically be an omnidirectional microphone. But with an open back guitar cabinet, using this works very, very well. We can just unhook it from the actual amp plug it into a DI box, even though I know that this is probably not the way that this gear is intended to work, but we're literally just using the DI box to convert a tip sleeve cable into a three prong cable, which is the XLR. And so from here, you know, I experimented with a little bit of positions, but this just sounds great right out of the box. It took basically no processing. Here's what it sounds like. Yeah, so again, a typical studio would have a guitar amp laying around. You can easily, with an adapter or even a DI box like I did, turn it into a microphone, plug it into a preamp. It's probably not gonna need any gain at all. It might even need a pad, um, but it's a great way to add a different flavor and get a lot of low end out of a kick drum. Okay, moving on up to snare drum. On the top, we have the Audix i5, and then we have the SM57 stock on the bottom. Now, a lot of times, and in my own testing, because I know this for a fact, is that it's actually fairly forgiving on the position of the bottom mic. I usually don't do too close. If the top mic is maybe two finger distance or three finger distance from the top of the rim, maybe do a four or what would be maybe a five finger distance on the bottom mic. I usually add a little bit of space to it. But for the top mic, I'm usually coming in from the hi-hat, I'm aiming the back of the mic and coming in at about a 45 degree angle and I'm using either two or three fingers is kind of my measuring gauge. 
Another key thing about this snare drum is that it's a 13 inch snare drum. It has a little bit less ringing, a little bit less kind of gnarly tones that you have to kind of manage. So it's a little bit easier drum to actually tune. Then the head is an Evans uh, HD Dry, which has very tiny holes around the outside. It just helps to really focus the drum just a little bit. And with a thicker, kind of more dampening head, you need to compensate for that dampening because you're adding mass to the drum, whether it be a moon gel or a thicker head. And so you have to actually raise the pitch of where you usually are in your tension. So it requires a little bit higher pitch to get the same amount of kind of singing and, and tone out of the drum. So let's check it out. Here's just the snare drum on its own. Okay, so that's a pretty good sound, but also consider that the snare drum is created of three different layers of microphones. So, um, you know, t this, this video is really constrained to eight channels, just as kind of an experiment. So I didn't have a set of room mics. However, the snare sound is really uh, comprised of the close mics, top and bottom, the two overhead mics, and then as a third layer, the room mics. So here we're able to kind of compensate, um, add maybe a little bit of extra, you know, really fast compression on these overheads to kind of simulate the sound of a room mic. But keep in mind that the snare sound is not just about the close mics, especially if you're using a built-in uh, preamp out of an interface, you're going to have to kind of build up the layers to get a complete sound. So once again, it's close mics, overheads, and then room. And those three layers will build you a complete sound for your snare drum. Very, very important. Okay, so next up is the high tom. And you know, this, I think this is a 12 inch tom. Uh, I learned the head selection from Lid Shaw's course, the rock stars of drums. He's got this uh, course that talks about all sorts of drum stuff. And you know, his session player in the course talked about these heads, which are the smooth white emperor. And smooth white, I always thought was some kind of dorky head selection that you only saw in band class on the concert you know, bass drum. It was kind of weird, you know, it's just smooth and white and looked nothing like I'd ever seen in a drum head. But man, these heads sound fantastic. They have the kind of muffling and damping, uh, damping factor of what you'd expect out of an emperor, but then they have the brightness of something like a clear head. And it's really handy when you're dealing with cymbal bleed, you really don't wanna add EQ to get back your brightness. It's helpful to have the brightness from the get-go. So this smooth white emperor head really helps with that. But just to prove the point, I wanted to use just an SM57 on the high tom. This high tom is one of the easiest drums to record out of any drum kit you're going to hear the most fullness in the overheads with the high tom. And I mean, really, as long as you don't screw it up by putting a cymbal right outside the mic, it's really hard to screw up. Yeah, so one of the easiest drums to tune, one of the easiest drums to uh, record, um, just don't screw it up with cymbal bleed. Moving down in pitch to the floor tom. Uh, 
Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that the floor tom can benefit from a more colored mic. So instead of just an SM57, uh, we can go for something that is almost kick drum territory. I've seen people use a D6. I've seen people use a Beta 52. Um, but certainly I would go a little bit more neutral than that. I might go um, like an M88 by Bayer Dynamic. Um, uh, an Audux D4 is an excellent choice. That's kind of my f personal favorite right now. Um, between the, the M88 and the D4, depending on what you want and how much attack you want. If you want some more attack at 3K, use the M88. If you want just a more general purpose, full sound, uh, the D4 uh, I found is, is a personal favorite. It just always gets a good sound. For the position, I like to try to aim in towards the drum. You know, it's it's kind of a battle between the drummer hitting the mic and getting the position that you want. But I also mind the ride cymbal and the crash cymbal around this mic position. Sometimes I'll try to actually point the back of the mic first, gnaw out those cymbals, and then point the front of the mic at the drum, trying to kind of do two things at once. Here it is, just on its own. Yeah, so it's a really solid sound. I've been very pleased with these heads. In general, I tune the bottom head about a minor third above the pitch of the top head. So I, I don't know, it's just kind of a personal choice, a pattern that I've kind of stuck with over the years, but the bottom head is a bit higher than the batter head. Okay, so moving on to overheads. And believe it or not, this is actually where we should have started out with because the overheads, even though they may not be the main sound of the drum kit, they are going to outline for you how the drums are arranged in the individual volume and balance of those drums in a mix. Now you can always take this a bit further. You can push the kick louder, you can take the snare and, and push it louder or you know whatever. But if you're not a drummer and you don't know what the natural balance of the drum kit is, the overhead is your key. It's kind of like drawing out with a pencil very finely and then kind of painting in and then later erasing those pencil marks that were your guide. And so here we're using our overheads as our guide for the close mics. We find our uh, position, our stereo image with a stereo pair of overhead mics and then we are able to add in and fill in and reinforce the drum sounds with our close mics. And so, yes, channels seven and eight were uh, overhead left, overhead right. And here I'm using a technique that I developed where it's really a no-fails approach for drum recording. You use a near coincident or, you know, coincident approach like XY or ORTF, which is actually usually a, a preferred uh, method. And using a stereo bar, you can very quickly change the angle. You can change kind of the tilt of the mics and you can change the height of the mics and between those three elements you can you can do a lot you can you can make the kit wider than it actually is you can make the kit more narrower than it actually is you can go up you can go down which can actually help you capture more room or get rid of that room let's check this out Yeah, so while we're talking about overheads, I do want to mention that the cymbals are very hard to fake. You know, if you have really bad sounding cymbals, it's, I mean, there's not much you can do. I will say though, that is, if there is a frequency that's particularly bothersome, you could try to place the overheads directly over the cymbals. So it's kind of counterintuitive because it seems like that would make them louder. but you know, next time you're at a drum kit, sit down on the drummer's stool, hit the cymbals, then stand up, and hit the cymbals. And I guarantee you, they're gonna have a little bit of a scooped sound when standing over the cymbals. 
And I believe that the uh, radiation of the symbols actually comes out at an angle from, I don't know, about five degrees up to about 45 degrees. And towards the bell of the symbol, there's actually not too much sound. And so it actually kind of creates a hollowed out upper mid range that I think is around three to four K and it kind of hollows out the sound, making it a bit more mellow sounding. So again, if you have a stereo bar, this is way easier because now you can take the stereo bar, you can position it and dial it in to hopefully avoid some clanginess in bad sounding cymbals. But I will say that there's kind of no substitute for actually investing in, you know, one good ride cymbal that just sounds fantastic. I found that you can kind of cheap out on the hi-hats. Um, if you can't really invest too much, you can stick with the same hi-hats, but definitely get at least one decent sounding ride cymbal. The Sweet uh, Ride uh, by Zildjian, 21 inch, that's actually an excellent example for um, basically a non-K cymbal that actually sounds really good. But then I'm a huge fa um, fan of um, like the Byzance by Meinl, um, the K Dark by Zildjian, the HHX by Sabian, of course the HH, which are actually kind of known for being quiet and don't really project, which is fantastic for room mics when you have the cymbals constantly overwhelming uh, the sound of the drums in your room mics. So there you have it. This was kind of my dissection of a drum sound. And the average price of, of the mics on the kit were probably just over a little over $100. So, you know, SM57, Onyx i5. Um, the most expensive one was the SM7B, but I think a lot of people would have that for vocals. Um, you know, the Lewitts I'm very, very pleased with, but those are still very affordable, so surprisingly good. Okay, so let me know what you think of this video. Talk to you soon.